Go for it. Okay, so it seems to be recording. So, yeah, it's okay. recording. so we will have to behave ourselves now. <laughs> okay, we'll try. No, no, never behave. <laughs> Uh, it, immediately that you know that it's public with me, I start getting you know heart palpitations and silliness, but it doesn't matter. Let's talk about what we started talking about earlier, because I think that every time I get to us get asked to do something public about HIV and it's World AIDS Day and I miss John and so many people, I you know because I was just thinking, Jim, what what made you really make this? If that's not a stupid question. Why oh, did you want no, to no, make no, it no. in anger? Um, let me just say that it says Dan Glass down, down there in my box, but I'm Jim Hubbard, so. Yeah, I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know you know, but the people who are watching this. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have to remember that there's going to be a future audience for this. Um, oh. Well, you know, back I have to go back 40 years because that that's, when this film began, you know, when when AIDS first appeared um, or was first recognized in the early 80s, I, I wanted to make a film about it, but I wasn't going to do what the main mainstream media was was doing, which was um, taking their cameras into hospital rooms, filming people on their deathbeds filming people literally in the worst light possible. Now, either on their deathbeds or because it was such a horrible thing to have HIV. It wasn't even HIV then. To, a horrible thing to have AIDS that they were, they were backlit and silhouetted because it would be so shameful to show them um, to the world. And, and I, I couldn't do that. But it, it was really hard to figure out how, how do you film Film this. And the first thing that I started do, filming a friend of mine who, who was very public about having AIDS. Um, so um, that, that issue wasn't there. But, but the issue of having my camera in his face all the time was impossible for him. And um, so that, that didn't go very far. And the next thing that happened in, in August of 1984, my ex-lover who was named Roger Jacoby, who was also a filmmaker, got diagnosed and he wanted to be filmed. Um, and so, so I filmed him for the rest of his life. And, and in fact, uh, last week was, oh, let's do the math, the 35th anniversary of his death because he died in November. 1985 mm -hmm. and and so I so I filmed him and then act up erupted in March of 1987 and starting in actually in June of 87 at the, at the gay pride march I started filming act up so I had the personal and the pri private uh, the personal and private aspects and the public aspect of the AIDS crisis and I made a film called elegy in the streets um, so, so that was the beginning of my, my filming the, the AIDS crisis, but, but United in Anger, um, um, United in Anger started, well, actually it started in June of 2001, Sarah Schulman called me, um, it was the 20th anniversary of, of AIDS. And she was in LA and driving a car and listening to the radio. And Sarah's a real New Yorker and didn't learn to drive till she was 40 years old. Um, mm -hmm. So she shouldn't be doing anything but paying attention. And she practically ran off the road because she was listening to this radio program about the 20th anniversary of AIDS. And they said in essence that at first, at first Americans were upset by AIDS, but then they got used to it. And she called me up and said, we have to, you know, do something about this complete erasure of the thousands of AIDS activists who forced the US government, forced governments around the world, forced the mainstream media to deal with, with the crisis. Um, and that, you know, and discussions after that was what led us to start the ACT UP Oral History Project. Right. And, 
from, you know, because I'm a filmmaker, doing the ACT UP oral history project led directly to wanting to make a film about it and United in Anger. So basically it was to make sure that, yeah, because that's how, yeah, the drug user oral history, which has just come out this year, that's why it came out, because we basically were thinking all this work and life lost and everything has not been recorded. And it would be a tragedy if we didn't do something, you know. Um, how did you get the funding, though? Oh. Didn't they the bomb? Um, well, the, the film itself was actually done quite inexpensively, but, but mm -hmm. the oral history project is actually is an, an, an expensive um, project, uh, especially since because it went over you know, 15 years. That, um, and it's the first time, first time in my life uh, that I ever had funding for a project. Mm -hmm. And the, the way it occurred, I think at first when we were talking about it, we were fully prepared to just jump in the deep end uh, and, and start the project. Uh, but we started talking to people. And one of the people that Sarah talked to was Urvashi Vad, who's a longtime um, queer activist and an AIDS activist. And at the time, she was at the Ford Foundation. Oh, handy. And, yeah, <laughs> right. And we went in and had a meeting to her and told her what we were thinking of doing, planning to do. And, and she was the one who, who found the money at, at the Ford Foundation. It, it, it was, she was in the social justice department at the time, she got money from the HIV division and from the um, civil rights division and mm -hmm. put, put together this, this funding for, um, for us. And I always say that the Act of Oral History Project and United in Anger were almost completely funded by lesbians who had access to other people's money. <laughs> you know, lesbians at, at foundations and things like it, it is actually it's very strange because there there isn't a whole lot of film money in united in anger and um and the the money you know from you know all those gay white men are supposed to have lots of money um you know they we got some funding but but the bulk of the funding was definitely you know because because of this um lesbian infrastructure Okay. Is that because women are more wanting to have things shared than the men? I, yes. <laughs> Tony, you should come you know, in. When I was watching the film um, last night, um, I couldn't help but think of how some things have changed, but also how little mm. has changed. Because you know we're we're okay. We're now in the middle of a pandemic. We've got um, conservative governments in America and in England, both of whom we can't rely on to do anything for people who aren't um, sufficiently well off to be able to you know take care of their own, their own sort of health needs. And um, um, so none of that's kind of really changed. And in fact, I think it's really got worse. And um, although I remember, like, because I was a founder member of ACT UP in Melbourne in um, 1989, I was, I remember going to some of the, the first meetings there. And um, I just, that's why I got really nostalgic when I was watching the film last night. And it just felt very emotional, kind of having to sort of reliving a, a, a lot of those times. Um, and, um, so I don't really know what my point is, but I'm just sort of making an observation. Absolutely. Oh, you yeah, know, that's right. When, when ACT UP started in, in Australia, you know, we had a, we had a um, Labor government here. Um, the health minister was a guy called Neil Blewett. And um, so I think things really, um, I think things were easier for us than they were in America and in the UK. And also even now, you know, when you think about COVID, I mean, I'm in Sydney at the moment and we're 23 days now COVID free. Wow. wow! Congratulations! Yeah, yeah. yeah. Apparently, in in five in in a few more days, 
we'll have officially reached the point where the where the virus has been eliminated. Bloody but that, hell. Yeah, no, it's quite amazing when you think about it. Um, we don't even hear that in England, as you know. Well, no, I mean, you know, but, you know, even, but the irony, I mean, we still, we have a conservative okay. government here at the moment in Australia, um, but they're just really hot on healthcare, and I think they always have been. You know. So anyway, my question to you, Jim, is, is it's a long-winded way of kind of asking you where you feel things are now um, from where they were um, back in the... 80s, you know, when ACT UP sort of started. I mean, what lessons have we learned? I mean, it just feels like things have got worse in a way, I don't know. Yeah, you know, I mean, okay. Wait. What I usually say is that the one big difference between, between the AIDS crisis and the COVID pandemic is that because of the lockdowns, we all feel uh, part of this. We're, we're all involved. And, you know, in the AIDS crisis, it seemed, you know, it was, it was definitely us against them that we, we, meaning those, you know, people who had HIV and people in the trenches with them, um, had to force, you know, the government to do something, and it's so that's a big difference. But but then I see things like, I mean, here in the U.S., <clears throat> we're seeing the exact same hospital crisis that we saw in in the mm. 80s it's i mean it is literally the same thing people dying in emergency rooms people dying in corridors there are not enough beds there are not enough rooms the the healthcare system was completely unprepared for this and and so it's it's an ex, it's an almost precise replay and then the other thing is of course that at least in the US that it's people who of of color and poor people who are bearing the brunt yeah. of same in like England. Uh, yeah. It's the same. Yeah, I don't I mean you know it's funny. It's it's not funny. It's I always think, well in England they have the NHS. Everybody has health insurance. And I, you know, I have enough English friends who uh complain about the NHS to know that that's simplistic analysis. But yeah, but, but when you're a migrant here you don't have the NHS. You know, there's, there's lots of people here who can't access the NHS as well and who are afraid to go there because the NHS has been made into being a passport controller. And, um, and I think there is a lot of, of people we don't even see who can't access the NHS. And it's... The other, it's the, other thing that I, the other thing that I noticed or that I um, thought about, you know, was when I was watching the film last night, it was that was that back in those days, you know, back in the late sort of 80s, early 90s, you know, difference existed between people, but I felt there was more tolerance and people were more open to, um, you know, to talking about um, differences um, and disagreements. And, you know, you could almost have a conversation with someone who, who, who might have a different opinion to you about a particular topic, but that you could still sort of openly kind of discuss it with them, and, you know, and it was possible that their opinion might change. Whereas now I find that, you know, the arguments have just become so completely polarized that, you know, if you're not batting on the same team, or if you're not, if you're not, if you don't hold the same opinion as someone else, say for instance, on social media, it just, it just becomes an, it, feels like, you know, suddenly there's, there's a war going on between you, you know? And I just wonder if that was one of the things which kind of really helped ACT UP succeed in a way, because, because you did really manage to change people's opinions um, about, and, you know, healthcare eventually, I mean, the, mm. there was a huge shift in people's perceptions, you know, um, as a result of the work, a lot of the work that ACT UP did. And I just feel that like sometimes, you know, that kind of activism is very hard to find now. I don't but know where I, it is. Can I just say one thing before Jim answers that? Back then, we were in that place where everything was so horrible and everybody was sick that we actually were behaving like human beings for a change with big hearts. Mm. And I think that is a big difference between where we are now. Now we're deprived people, lots and lots of people are really struggling 
because of the financial crash and everything that's gone on with these conservative governments and all the Brexit and Trump and racism. I mean, it's got really nasty out there. And I think that's one of the reasons that, you know, in answer to your question, but I'll shut up because that was a question to Jim, of course. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think, you know, uh, you answered it very well. I, you know, uh, as you were asking it, I thought, oh, I, God, I thought this was an American problem. But I guess, it, but it is, it's a worldwide problem, isn't it? That there, this polarization of, of opinion. And I, you know, I guess, you know, being a leftist, I have to blame the right wing. I think it really <laughs> is their, their, their fault because of the way, you know, they, they've spent the last 30 years mm -hmm. screaming, you know, that there's only one way to think mm -hmm. about political problems and it delegitimizes it not only delegitimizes the other side but it delegitimizes de dialogue and conversation and so well, i think they've just, they've just pitted us against every everyone else haven't they? exactly it's that's very, the thing yeah, that's just the on, tragedy of this but it's on a very domestic kind of personal level isn't it so you know, and social media is kind of the big brother now, which sort of didn't exist back then. Um, um, so, yeah, I don't know. I just, I just find, you know, there's a real lack of empathy, real lack of kindness um, in the world now. And I, you know, I don't know, I know it sounds like something of a cliche to kind of keep talking about this, but I actually really think, you know, social media has a, has a lot to do. And I actually think, especially younger, people, you know, who I'm meeting on um, socials and so on, I just think, you know, like, get off your computer and just get out there and, like, really campaign and canvas and pick up the phone and start talking to people, you know. Mm. There was a line, I remember, in Penny Arcade show, Longing Lasts Longer, where it was, you know, hitting like on Facebook is not activism. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, I want to come from a very different kind of perspective because, obviously, in the 80s and early 90s, I was, I mean, especially in the 80s, I was in Soviet Union. So totally different on the other side of the Iron Curtain. I mean, in Estonia, which is very nationalistic little country. And at that at time, obviously, we didn't yet have that health crisis. We were behind the walls. And, um, and what we got were the sort of news from the West and it was a specific way how it was obviously um, written in, in the Soviet media. But in, in many ways, um, I wanna, where I wanted to come was that at that time, you also had the East, you had the sort of Soviet bloc. And I think there was that kind of thing where there was this hope in the West that in the Eastern Bloc, things are slightly better. And it was balancing the very right wing things also in the West, in a sense that there was this other power as we have lost it now. We don't have that, that sort of, but I know that in, uh, I've had lots of conversations with, with people in the West where they, they really had this sort of like, very sort of um, distorted view what Soviet Union was at that time. But I think it did have that sort of hope that you had that sort of left ally somewhere as well, as now we don't have it. We don't have that other power and the entire world is very right wing. Um, but I wanted to kind of like, come because I joined ACT UP in, in London after seeing the film on one of those screenings. Maybe it was the same screening where you got very upset, Andrea. <laughs> Could have been about Maybe the same about time. five or six years ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was 2015, I think, yes. Um, or 2014, yeah. something like that. It was when um, I was really heavy with Sarah, for God's sake, because I couldn't see any drug users, but I knew there were <laughs> drug users in there because they were all friends of mine and they were all dead. And so I just went a bit mental. But anyway, Sarah's forgiven me now. Let's move on. Sorry, carry <laughs> on. <laughs> no, no, no. I was kind of like, as as I was kind of like, wanted to sort of like, um, a little bit lost my thought, but but as I got kind of inspired by the film, and obviously in the, in the 80s, we had different activism. We were trying to get away from Soviet Union. We had a kind of like more political things going on in our heads. But there was a there were certain kind of things that I thought the film was very good at sort of activating this sort of internal need for activism in a sense. Mm. And I, and every time when I've been showing it to um, a few times shown it to 
or, or part of it shown to students. There's a project in, in, in Scotland in Perth where uh, with Terence Seekings Trust and with the local um, art school there where they do for World AIDS Day, they, they try to make the students um, the entire term, they are actually working um, to produce works um, on um, HIV crisis and stigma and things like that. And, and it's kind of like a really interesting project, which is which has been going on for 10 years or more than 10 years now. But they hadn't seen the film until I went in about three years ago, which was kind of like an interesting thing. They've been told many things, but they hadn't seen the activist side. And, and, and so I kind of wanted to ask... Um, about the kind of um, way how you, how you think the film is that kind of tool and it's become this kind of like motivation tool. Mm -hmm. So kind of some yeah. comments. Great question. <laughs> um, yeah, no, yes, it is. Um, well, I always maintain that there were two main purposes um, for United in Anger. And one was to put the, um, AIDS activist movement and ACT UP specifically, right in the in the middle of mainstream US history where it rightfully belonged. Mm. But the other was to provide a, a blueprint for future activism, you know, grass, grassroots political action, whatever, whatever the particular uh, subject was. And, and that's why, you know, I put in all, all the, the information and about the nuts and bolts of political organizing, the issues of affinity groups, of, um, of, of making posters and all, all the, the things that you have to do, because I think the universal um, the universal message of United in Anger is that a small group of people really focused on, on the subject at hand who come up with practical solutions can, re can change the world. And, and I think that can be done on, on you know, lots of political issues in lots of different political situations. I mean, you're bringing up you know, the situation in Estonia in the 1980s. Well, the, the, so the, the business of every system has its strengths and its, and its weaknesses. Every political system has, has, has that. And so the business the, the, of activism is to figure out what those strengths are, what those weaknesses are, and to use both of them in, in, an effort to to get what what they need. Can I say yeah. something in response to that just quickly? Um, I was thinking about I was involved with Occupy London, Jim, mm. and um, one of the things that I've noticed since then in 2011 is that the state government has started to use some of the language of Occupy. And it's adopted this thing as if it was the right on, you know, egalitarian, uh, anti-racist, pro-working class. I mean, you know, it's sickening what's yeah. actually happened. But of course, because the media is bought by them, they can easily do that. And I think one of the weaknesses may be then that we actually say, well, this is not accurate what's happening here. This would never have been part of the lexicon or nav narrative of particularly right-wing governments had it not been for people who, you know, froze to death outside St. Paul's Cathedral and, and um, what's the park called near Wall Street? Tompkins, no, was it Tompkins? Near Wall Street, it was Zukovsky Park. Zukovsky was, Park, et cetera, et cetera, around the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, like every now and then they will put somebody behind bars who's not paid his taxes or whatever. And, you know, they're always fall guys. So the system stays in place, but odd individuals are sacrificed because more and more millions of people now know the truth about what's going on with the economic and financial inequality 
Am I yeah. making any sense here? No, that's they, well. That's true. It, oh, by the way, it's it's Zuccotti Park. And, Zuccotti. Uh, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, I made him Polish instead of Italian, but um, um, yes. Well, you know, governments and and uh, and um, people in power do that. They 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 learn several lessons, and one of them is how to use how to use the language of the opposition without actually without actually adopting the the policies yeah. that need to change. Yeah. yeah. So you just have to keep fighting. You know, that's I mean there's a lot we can learn from ACT UP, I think. You know, I mean, you know, you you, you can be very um, targeted, you know, with, with what you want. You can strategize and think about, you know, how, how to achieve it. Um, you know, it's, it's a great place within which, you know, you can galvanize people to kind of do things, but just, just on, a, on a very sort of basic level. I mean, I think that, I think they're really certainly like, um, you know, they've, um, you know, as Jim was saying, you know, they really did kind of change the world. And, you know, I think there's a lot we can learn from their, from their strategies. Mm. But I think the other thing on the films also that you feel the sense of community and and that's kind of like really important. Um, and, and, I, and I was like um, wondering if, how you feel the sense of community uh, or when you were making the film, how that played an impact uh, on the film. Oh, the sense of community is absolutely foundational. Um, and, you know, for the film, uh, um, my purpose in making this, or not my purpose, but my, um, my intention in making this film was to make a film from ACT UP's point of view. Now, of course, it's my version of ACT UP's point of view, but, but still, it, 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 well, it grew out of the sense of community. Now, in the United States, the, the way the accepted way to make a documentary is to pick five or six people. And th those people become your characters and, and you tell the story through them. And from the very beginning, I said, I can't do that. That's Absolutely. because that would, that would be a betrayal of what ACT UP was. That mm -hmm. ACT UP, the, the way it worked and the way it worked best was that there was a fluidity of leadership that people rose to the occasion and when those people got exhausted or you know in many cases died other people rose rose to the occasion and also there was there was an emphasis on education in act up that there were always teachings so that every meeting there were there was a table you know tables 10 meters long filled with with paper stacks of paper giving information so that there was this constant education of the members so that it, when someone stuck a, a microphone in your face, you could say something, you, you could say, you knew what the situation was and you could say something. And so everyone ha had the, the, the right, the responsibility and the ability to sp speak for themselves. And, and, and it, it was that, the, led us to do the oral history project and it also led to in the making in the making of united in anger using lots of people that it, it would it would have been just you know just not true to to have five or six people tell what act up was you had to you know as many people as possible to tell the story because in, in reality in United in Anger, there's actually one character and that that's act up. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think all, one of the things which has always stuck with me um, over the years is just like how um, act up made heroes out of ordinary people. Like anybody could do anything mm -hmm. and um, you know, you could be on an action and um, you know, you could just feel really empowered and feel like a hero in the eyes of your peers and your friends and, and your community, you know. And I think that was one of the real things which kind of, I don't know, it really kept, it really kept the community together. You know, there was this feeling like we were sort of all 
kind of really in it together. You know, I miss that sort of come come round. Uh, come round yeah, I know it's the, it's the huge but problem. Really, because, because how do we, how do we create that this community? Yeah, it's not there anymore. When, I mean, it it wasn't yeah. there, you know, a year ago. I yeah. mean, unfortunately, I mean, there, I mean, the AIDS crisis and the I mean, at least in the U.S., the AIDS crisis, followed by the the triumph of assimilationist gay people who were, you know, more interested in in gay marriage and gays in the military, at least in the United States, <laughs> than in solving real, you know, problems of, of people, um, um, largely destroyed that community. And they're only, so they're only remnants of it. And, you know, ACT UP London is, is a remnant of, of, of a, a community. Um, yeah. And, but, but then the, the COVID pandemic, I mean, how do you, how do you have community when you can't meet? Exactly. Well, we do. We've had a few actions. Oh. When we came out of lockdown, Black Lives Matter had an incredible march and we did the 50th anniversary celebration, one of the several of uh, the Gay Liberation Front, Front. So, you know, we have done stuff, but it is an issue. But also, can I just say one thing that COVID brought us, which is emulating stuff that ACT UP did. When you think about, you know, back then, you know, to do with buddying and so on and so on, and people visiting each other who were unwell, you know. Now, I mean, even I decided that I was going to deliver food, and there are lots of mutual aid groups doing mm. stuff for people who are not supposed to be going out at all. I was actually one of the people that wasn't supposed to be going out, but I thought, fuck this, I've got a car. As long as I've got a mask on and I'm careful, I mm. have to help here. I can't be sat on my ass feeling like I'm a nothing, you know, I just can't do that. And I think that that is one opportunity, you know, when you were talking about strengths and weaknesses, that we need to jump on every single opportunity um, to do positive things and mobilize people. Because I think that um, Jeremy's point about the div divisiveness that's been happening has been really awful to everyone, hasn't it? I mean, it's yeah. just, sorry. Yeah. I mean, there were always divisions like within the gay community, within the LGBT community. But these days, it's just, it's, it just seems like, you know, people are at war with each other. And, you know, I just find it, I find it really hard. To I think the problem them. was you left women out. <laughs> and, and I think in London... Obviously, that's people, the problem. In, in, you know, the lesbians help with finding the money for the film. Uh, and I think, like, in, I think... I think in London ACT UP also we've had like different um, sort of whatever, it doesn't matter. But I think I have really sensed the community when we've been working with the women, you know, who was positively UK and, and with the catwalk for power. I think that has been where community has happened in recent times in London. And it's not, it has excluded the gay men because it has been a safe space for women. And, and I can only talk as an ally. And I think there is the thing there is that maybe the gay men need to open up and see and be more willing to be with the communities who need it more now because obviously for these these for, for many of these women the stigma is so huge and they have been like especially like last year catfolk for power went out of london and and i wasn't i couldn't go out but but Donna can talk about it and, and the way how those women in outside of London were feeling so isolated and so alone and, and so without community. And, and so I think it is also for, for maybe for ACT UP to try to find different ways of actually connecting with people and not having these bitter arguments. And, and they did, like in, in the, when I'm watching the film, there are these this this lots of occasions when people are going out to help each other that's all about this solidarity and i think it's it's that the moment i think it's so important to get off your high horse and and learn from the film and learn from the history and and just and and when covid hit yes um i think i was pretty disappointed in act up trying to get them behind some of the free the vaccines and and all the kind of campaign and people were somehow not at all um 
willing to 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 move. But in the US, I see ACT UP is really active on on this area as well, or at least that's kind of I have seen people people doing stuff there more than here. Anyway, <laughs> you said it. Well done. Um. Look, guys, I'm sorry I have to go because my day oh. is just starting here and I, oh. um, it's 10 to 8 and I've got an appointment um, in town at 8.30. But um, thanks for having me. And um, coming. And Jim, thanks for, yeah, the film. Actually, you know, I've got one question I just want to ask you okay. um, yeah. before, we, before we go. When I was watching it last night, did I see David Wanarovich in a frame? Uh, yes, he, he appears three times in the film, actually. I thought so. I he, thought so. It was yeah. the first time that I saw him the, last he, night. He stopped the church, yeah. smoked a cigarette. He's yeah. um, in Target City Hall, where he's um, a, on a line screaming and yelling. And that shot of him, the back of his jacket, which, which um, in where he says, um, when I die, forget burial, dump my uh, body on the steps of the FDA. That, that's actually wow. a lot of David at, at the FDA demonstration. Great stuff, brilliant. Anyway, look, I'm sorry to love you and leave you. I have to go, but- um, When you're um, back in you. London. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm back, come in, back in London. In I'm coming back in, in your summer. I'll be back there in June. Okay. June, that's way too long. You know, it's a long time. I'm, yeah, I don't know. I'm, get, I'm trying to stay easy. here as long as I can. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And I'm, I'm with my family, so. It's, it's awesome. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay, lots yeah. of love, everyone. Okay, See you great. Okay. Great to you. Yeah. I guess, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess my question would have been something about more the women's involvement and 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 a, a, a sort of because that was yeah anyway. <laughs> but I, I I can't get away from you know when you compare today to back then, you know because we have this with the drug user movement all the time. It's like there's always this little bit of sort of undercurrent and power struggles and bitchiness and blah 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 blah. As soon as there's a crisis, like we had this clostridium thing that was found in the batch of heroin that came from wherever, they found it in the ground. Anyway, the long and short of this thing is that whatever was in the heroin was killing a lot of people out of the blue. And suddenly we were the most loving family. We got shit together. We were super efficient. We found ways to get drugs legally. We were totally not in problems with access to needles and condoms and everything else we needed. We just got it together. And I think that is an issue. And I think, so now we need to like, one of the great things that I think I've learned in recovery is focus on the similarities rather than the differences. And one of the similarities right now is that we need to focus on is around uh, inequality. And the numbers of people are being fucked over by the destruction Sorry, I'm talking a bit um, English, England here. No, 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 it's fine. This is because but, this is for an English audience. The destruction of the National Health Service and the welfare state. These are massive, massive issues. And if we don't focus there, I don't know how we're going to build community again. Yeah, I always have a problem that I feel like I, I, my answer is always US specific. And so I, I am a little wary of that but but i yes crisis creates creates unity and it creates opportunity for change and and the urgency the urgency is what what created act up mm. um, but but the other thing is that it's it's in that space in between crises that that so much of the work of activism goes on, and, yeah. and the people yeah. who do that do it in between the crises are are the real heroes because it's thankless work, but it's it's work that makes the reaction to the crises possible. Mm. Yeah, well, I think that was partly what Mari was referring to with mm. the cat for power. Do you know what the catwalk for power is, Jim? Uh, no, I don't. Can you, Mari? Can you tell Jim? Well, some years ago, um, which we've, we've been part of ACT UP, Donna and me, kind of like as an allies. And uh, 
And then there is an organization called Positively UK here, which started as Positively Women. And, um, and, and as, as a feminist and lesbians, we always sort of thought it's really important to that women's um, issues are um, kind of visible. And ACT UP was always in meetings, were always just boys. And, and, and we, even so we felt really passionate about all the issues, we just felt that there is not enough women there. And then we happened to also, um, th 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 there's in Positively UK, there's a women's group gets together on like Wednesdays or whatever other day. So, but it's, it's, um, it's more like a very practical help um, to, uh, to people to, to meet each other and talk. And then in, in some of their meetings, they also sort of thought, oh, we need to do something for with women. And uh, the women came up with an idea that they all interested in fashion, you know, let's, let's have a catwalk. And it was all, at first it was like, that's really maybe not like the right way or whatever. Um, and then we got involved from ACT UP with, and we met um, uh, probably three years ago and had a first meeting which was about five people and talking about what we can, what, what can be done and then how can it be turned into a bit more, not only uh, that it will be, just doing workshops and the women will have a catwalk but but really use this to to grow the community and 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 give them different different tools in a sense and it is led by the women and there is a website which is like a catwalk for power kind of like a toolkit so first we started having like just workshops and we were just making really simple things like paper beads or whatever but it was also for the women to get together and discuss what they actually really want and it has really grown. Um, we had over 40 women by the end, for like a few months later. And we had the first public event, uh, which I'm still getting shivers on my skin because these women were not out. They weren't telling to anybody that they are HIV positive. Very few of them were out. And we had public event where it was about 200 people in, um, in, in, in the event. And at first, the women were like, they made these dresses and we made different types of, there was different types of workshops, leadership workshops, in you know, a kind of act up mind as well, kind of like teaching people different skills and then tooling them mm -hmm. up. And, and, and then we had over 20 women who were proudly walking. Nobody put the mask on. We had a pile of masks, which they had spent like weeks making this mask to cover their faces. And then they all walked proud and it's been growing. So there's lots of this. Without the masks. Without, they all walked without the masks. I mean, there were obviously another 20 who were just not on a stage, but they were still there. They were part of this community and it has been growing and it's been going out from London to Manchester and, 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 and Brighton. And, 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 and it's, 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 it's get these women together who were very isolated. In London, they've been much more kind of like had more opportunities to meet up, but especially outside, they didn't. And, and it's, it's given them like so many of them are now talking publicly. They have, um, some of them have got um, employments in, 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 the, in the sector and are, are tooling up other women, are supporting them. And it's been just really, really fantastic in terms of, um, there were women who came first year and walked away because they couldn't even face who are now the biggest out there talking to, to their communities, talking to outside world. And, um, and they, they are primarily, uh, women of color, um, and and it's just really amazing to see this this happening. So, yeah. So there's a yeah there's a toolkit we, which we produced this year to sort of like just share this experience. And obviously, being as an ally, it's just been just such a privilege to see these women women kind of grow. And we went to Amsterdam to the AIDS um, conference, and we did self fundraising and all sorts of things. So there's lots of stuff which has happened with this project. And I mean. Um, Donna, who is downstairs there next to Andrea, she's, yeah, she's done Donna, so yeah. much work for for this, and and so it's 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 been like amazing to to see, oh, and and has been green, no, yeah. Okay. And the women also watched United in Anger, and they just really got tooled up, and they were like really sort of like they had, you know, that that also gave them sort of like we need to speak, you know, we need to do that. So 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 the, um, yeah. <laughs> So that, right, you know, it's exact. It's the same. It's the same lesson that that yeah. you have to you have to use whatever tools you have, whatever technology, whatever you know, and and it has to grow out of your community, and use your own the, whatever strengths you have to. Yeah. 
to get what you need and, yes. and to, you know, to, to grow the movement and, and to make it more powerful. So, yeah. yeah, that's the the, it's exactly the same process. Oh, sorry. No, go on. I was just going to say in the earliest stage of organizing, like, I mean, we had the, early, the very early discussions in late 2017. And then in early 2018, we were showing them films like United at Anger and How to Survive a Plague. And there was, there was very much a feeling of legacy, of passing on this idea that as allies, we're going to teach some things we know. And, and there were always, there were strong peer supporters living with HIV within the group as well, also te teaching what they knew. And then we'd gradually devolve the power. Do you know what I mean? So then by the end of it, we're kind of standing back as the people that go Are buy learning. the art supplies, um, you know, put, put dinner on the table and fill out the space, <laughs> then, you know, do the childcare. Um, but there was that very much an understanding of like, those act up lessons about everyone's an expert in an area and you've got to find your niche, mercurially find your little group within the group and then just take your experience well, and blow it out. It was, it was pretty cool, actually. I think yeah. they, they really got a lot out of those films, I think. Totally. Mm. I think that's what good activism is, yeah. is that you make everybody feel useful, you know, in a crisis and even not in a crisis, as you said, Jim, you know, that bit in between that isn't, you know, in the middle of the crisis, but has, you know, back up. It's like the backbone of social movements, social justice movements, if I'm making any sense here. So, so I think we need to wrap up. <laughs> but, um, we um, haven't asked as many questions as we should have probably. But. I don't know. Is there, is there anything specific that you really think we, we should talk about that we haven't? I've got a question about that's purely technical. Okay. Yeah. And, and that is that over the last eight years, I've been live streaming a lot of actions here in England, mostly London from Occupy and, you know, while we watch our NHS be destroyed, etc. And I wondered if there's a way of, I mean, you know, maybe I could just write to you online and ask you, but it's about, you know, whether it can be used because it's done on small SD cards that go into phones, but they can be blown up, I understand. Um, right, yes. Well, so you, sh you, you should be saving all this material. It's not only it should be on SD cards, but you should um, uh, copy to the computer to hard drives and right. probably have a copy in the cloud somewhere so that it is um, not lost. Yeah, not lost. And then and then find a way to, so that people can access it. So the, yeah, there are a lot of issues about preserving history and, and accessing, accessing history that, um, yeah. Andrea that's... can help. No. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> yes, you, you know, use your local talent there. <laughs> I will. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. It's so good to meet you. Yeah, it's really great. Uh, yeah, I'm really glad we did. Thank you so much. It's nice to make a put the face to the filmmaker. And, yeah, uh, I hope we can do this again in really in person because yeah. uh, one of the things that, that's hardest for me personally about the COVID crisis is not being able to travel. Mm. Um, you know, two weeks ago, three three screenings of United in Anger were were transferred online, but they were supposed to be in person. Um, and, you know, so yeah, you know, I'd love to be able to yeah. do this and, and talk to people and meet people yeah. again. I have, yeah, I have a same issue here as an artist that it's like even yesterday got the message from Moscow. So could you be online? I said, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, yeah, thank you so much. And I think this, I mean, there is a YouTube versions of the film, which I think that's what we have been kind of sneakily using. <laughs> Oh yeah, we'll use the use the um, use the um, the versions on Vimeo because they're, they're oh, there's a better, better one on Vimeo quality. now. And um, I can give you the the secret password. So you can oh, that would be fantastic. Free, when we... but now now uh, so I just redid the United Anger website. It'll be live. It should be live tomorrow. 
And yeah. on, on my website, jimhubbardfilms.com, you can now you can now watch United in Anger. Uh, mm. And but if you want to set up group screenings, I we I am I'm happy to do that, and we can we can do it. That would be free if, if you don't have any fun. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, because it is usually just inspiring other kind of budding young, young activists or things like that. It's yeah. a ad hoc thing. Or artists, I mean, um, it's often kind of like trying to get to talk to art students and, and see what, yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much. Okay, yeah. well, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I can send you the link of the Catwalk for Power. <laughs> okay, yeah, please do that. So, so can I just, just check? So Jim, what you saved Presumably Dan's going to get access to it, and yes, then he I, can put I, it on the Act Up London lists. Right. Okay. So I'm gonna. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording. Cool. Okay. Stop recording. <laughs>